Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the 28th October Weekly Market Review. As usual, I have my co-host with me here today, Mr. Gerald Wong. How is your weekend, Gerald? Hi, everyone. Uh, it was a good weekend. Um, I think we have a shorter work week this week to be looking forward to. Um, and also, I think we have seen a number of REITs reporting their results in the past week. So that's hopefully something that I can go through with the audience today. Definitely. I think a lot of our audience are concerned that the yields in the US is slightly getting a bit higher and we saw some pullbacks in the REITs. So we look forward to your updates today. And of course, we have the big Tesla earnings last week, which caused the 22% jump in Tesla share price. And this week, we are looking at the Magnificent 7 with Apple, Microsoft and Google all reporting their earnings this week. And of course, we also have a holiday on Thursday before we come back on Friday for the non-farm payroll day. So an exciting week ahead, but I shouldn't drag the time for now. And I'll let Gerald continue with the updates for this week. Okay, thanks, Ali. Um, so the usual disclaimer that today's sharing is for information purposes only and should not be taken to be financial advice. Uh, we have a uh, upcoming Ask Sias on the 20th of November. So if you couldn't catch Sunny in last month's session and you have uh, various charts that you want him to be helping to analyze, uh, do join us for the upcoming Ask Sias on 20th of November. If you find the weekly market review helpful, do leave us a review on Google. And if you are wondering how you can join Sias as a member, you can scan this QR code or go to the website sias.org.sg slash membership. And as a Sias member, you'll be able to access various online resources as well as investor education programs. Okay, so uh, what did we see in the past week? Uh, the S&P 500 fell by 1%. Uh, so this marks its first weekly decline after six consecutive weeks of gains. But within this uh, fall in the S&P 500, uh, we see some divergence in terms of the performance of various stocks as we go into the U.S. earnings season. Okay, uh, So for example, we see that the Nasdaq was up by 0.2%, a uh, big part driven by the improved sentiment given the strong earnings reported by Tesla. Okay. On the other hand, the Dow Jones was down by 2.7% and a lot of the companies that disappointed on the earnings uh, actually put down the Dow Jones index. Uh, for the STI, we had a 1.3% decline, now back to below the 3,600 levels uh, and a big part of the losses were contributed by the Singapore REITs. The key market movement in the past week was really this big move up in your U.S. government bond yields. Okay, uh, I put out the chart for the U.S. 10-year government bond yield and we see here that uh, it has actually exceeded 4.2% last week um, from a low of about 3.6% sometime in September. So a fairly big move within a short period of time and coming through after the Federal Reserve interest rate cut. Uh, at 4.2%, it will be back to the level sometime in July, uh, which would mean that we are looking at the highest level of bond yields in about three months. Okay. Uh, what is driving this increase in the bond yields? Uh, number one, uh, the US economic data has come through stronger than expected. Um, if you look at some of the retail sales data, uh, if you look at some of the spending data, they have still been fairly resilient. Um, there were various Federal Reserve officials that came out to speak last week, and I think that has actually moderated the investor expectations on the pace of future interest rate cuts. So that is what we see here for the CME Fed Watch 2. Um, this would be the interest rate expectations for the rest of the year, as well as for 2025. Okay, what we see here is um, the two rate cuts expected in this year remains intact. Okay, so one rate cut of 0.25% expected in November, another one in December, and that will bring the Federal Reserve target rate uh, to 4.25 to 4.5 percent but looking to 2025 that is where the expectations have moderated very significantly 
uh, such that through the end of 2025, uh, we are looking at just three incremental rate cuts compared to where it is in December this year. Okay, so potentially uh, we are looking at the interest rate uh, being at 3.5 to 3.75% at December 2025. And that will represent a moderation of interest rate cut expectations. Okay, uh, to depict the moderation in interest rate cut expectations more clearly, uh, I've put out this chart which shows the comparison around the probability at different points in time. Okay, so if you follow me as I read through this chart, um, the light blue column at the extreme right is actually what expectations were um, actually one month ago. Okay, so if I look at one month ago on the 27th of September, uh, the light blue bar with the highest height would be 3% to 3.25%. Okay. So effectively, what this tells us is that one month ago, uh, the investors were assigning the largest probability that the interest rate will be 3 to 3.25% in the June 2025 Fed meeting. Okay? But if I were to look at current expectations, which is the dark blue line uh, on the extreme left, then the one with the highest probability is actually 375 to 4%. Okay, so what this means is that within the space of one month, investors have moderated their expectations of the rate cuts by about 0.75%, or in other words, uh, there were three more rate cuts expected in one month ago on 27th of September, and that has actually been reduced very significantly over the past one month. Okay, if I were to look at the STI, uh, we saw a number of Jardine related stocks amongst the top gainers, uh, such as DFI Retail Group, as well as Jardine Psyche and Carriage. Uh, SETS also did very well uh, following a broker upgrade. Um, so those were the names that outperformed the Straits Times Index. Okay, if you were to look at the top losers, uh, what we see here would be a number of REITs. Uh, including Maple Tree Logistics Trust, uh, Capital Land Integrated Commercial Trust, as well as Fraser's Logistics and Commercial Trust. Okay, so um, if we were to look at the uh, top movers amongst the REITs, um, we have the data center REITs that actually did better than a basket of Singapore REITs. Uh, that is due to the better than expected earnings by some of these data center reads, such as Kappa DC read, as well as Digital Core read. Okay, on the other hand, uh, we saw a number of reads that reported their earnings, uh, including Maple Tree Pan Asia Commercial Trust, uh, that actually saw their share prices falling after that. So I'll go through some of these names, uh, including Maple Tree Logistics Trust and Maple Tree Pan Asia Commercial Trust in more detail. Okay, I'll start with uh, Maple Tree Logistics Trust. Uh, it is one of the names that is very widely followed by quite a number of investors. Um, and the company provided um, their earnings update last week. So what we see for Maple Tree Logistics Trust, uh, the share price actually rebounded uh, from August in anticipation of the Fed rate cuts. Uh, so from just below $1.30, uh, it rebounded to close to $1.50. Okay, uh, but over the past few weeks, we have seen it falling back to 137 level uh, due to two things. Number one would be the expectations that the Fed will not cut interest rates as aggressively going forward based on what we saw earlier. And secondly, would be driven by the earnings that were reported by MLT last week. Okay, so what we saw for MLT is that the gross revenue um, for the quarter ending 30th of September was down about 2% compared to the previous year. Uh, and with that, the net property income was also down by 2%. Okay, uh, but because we saw an increase in the borrowing costs, um, so that actually put down the distributable income. Okay. So overall, we are looking at a 10.6% decline in the DPU in the quarter ending 30th of September uh, to 2.027 cents. 
Okay, uh, if you look at the performance of the assets, uh, the occupancy rate uh, improved slightly to 96%. Okay, so compared to what it was in June, which was 95.7%, uh, that is actually an improvement. But across the portfolio, uh, once again, we see a divergence in terms of the performance. And it is really still the China assets that are pulling down the overall uh, portfolio occupancy, uh, given that the China occupancy is at 93.1%, uh, which is flat from where it was in June this year. Okay, uh, if you were to look at the uh, rental reversions, uh, then that is where we see that on a portfolio basis, that has turned negative to negative 0.6% versus a 2.6% increase in the previous quarter. Okay, um, a big part of this decline is actually driven by China. So we see here that the rental reversions were negative 12.2%. Uh, a more significant decline compared to the 11.3% decline in the previous quarter. Okay, um, and with that, uh, we see that the portfolio rental reversions was down. Uh, excluding China, what we see is that the rental reversions would be positive 3.6%, and the improvement in terms of the occupant, uh, in terms of the rental reversions, uh, what we see is that for Singapore there was an improvement from twelve point from seven point eight percent to twelve point five percent. Okay, in terms of the balance sheet for Maple Tree Logistics Trust, uh, we saw the leverage ratio going up slightly, uh, now to above forty percent at just forty point two percent. Okay, uh, and in terms of what we see in terms of the interest coverage ratio at three point five times. Uh, which is about flat compared to the previous quarter. So that is still something that is quite comfortable. Okay, in terms of the valuation for Maple Tree Logistics Trust, uh, price to book of about 1.03 times, just slightly above the historical average. And if I were to look at the dividend yield, 6.6%, uh, .6%, uh, which is also slightly above the historical average. Okay, uh, next I will go through Maple Tree Pan Asia Commercial Trust. Uh, this is a read where we see the same trend compared to Maple Tree Logistics Trust, but in a more significant move uh, in anticipation of the Fed rate cut, uh, moving from about 125 per share to above 150 per share. Uh, before now declining to $1.34 uh, with a sharp fall after the most recent earnings report. Okay, so what we see here for uh, Maple Tree Pan Asia Commercial Trust is that uh, the gross revenue declined by 6% uh, and the net property income decreased by 8.5% compared to the previous year. Okay, um, in terms of the distribution per unit, uh, actually came down by 11.6% to 1.98 cents compared to 2.24 cents in the previous year. Okay, if you were to look at the underlying fundamentals of Maple Tree Pan Asia Commercial Trust, uh, this would actually show the rental reversions. And what we see here is that uh, what is particularly weak in this quarter would be the Japan properties, Okay. So for, say, the Singapore assets, including uh, NBC, Vivo City, other SG properties, we are still seeing positive rental reversions. But if you're to look at Japan, uh, the rental reversion is actually negative 9.5%. Okay, So that is something that uh, we will discuss further as to what is driving this weakness. Okay, And with the weakness in the rental reversions in its overseas properties, uh, even with the strength in the Singapore properties, we are looking at a positive reversion of 4.1% across the entire portfolio. Okay, uh, if we were to look at the occupancy rate, uh, it is a similar picture uh, where the Singapore properties are still fairly resilient, particularly Vivo City. 
but it is really the Japan properties, uh, once again, a very sharp fall in terms of the occupancy rate from 94.2% in the previous quarter to now 82.3%. Okay, So the negative surprise is really in the Japan properties where we have seen a decline in the occupancy rate as well as fairly sizable negative rental reversions. Okay, so what is causing the weakness? Uh, we have got these three properties in Japan, uh, which the read will call them the Makuhari properties, accounting for about 5.4% of Maple Tree Pen Asia Commercial Trust uh, total net property income. So what the manager has observed is that there's pressure on occupancy levels as well as the market rents. Uh, at the same time, we also have the key and single tenant for one of the buildings, uh, the Fujitsu uh, Makuhari building, actually expressing their intent not to renew its lease upon expiry on 31st March 2026. Okay, so that is actually something that was seen by investors to be a negative, uh, given that they have just one single tenant in this building and the tenant has actually expressed their intention not to renew the lease. Okay, so the REIT is doing various things to be able to mitigate the impact now, including intensifying the leasing and marketing efforts, uh, looking at various ways that the property can be used, and also pursuing divestment opportunities and other mitigating initiatives. But in the meantime, this has actually impacted the valuation of these three properties. Uh, so if you to look at the valuation of these properties, uh, there has been effectively a lower valuation ascribed to them. Okay, so if you to look at uh it from a Singapore dollar perspective, uh, compared to what it was in March two thousand and twenty four, uh, it represents a decline of about hundred and thirteen. 0.8 million uh, compared to the valuation as of March 2024. Okay, so that also represents a negative surprise, uh, which also explain why the share price of Maple Tree Pen Asia Commercial Trust was weaker. Okay, if we were to look at the valuation of Maple Tree Pen Asia Commercial Trust now, uh, price to book of 0.78 times, uh, which is still below the historical average, and the dividend yield of 6.7%, uh, which is above the historical average. But investors will probably want to see whether there is a further decline in its distributions to understand whether this dividend yield is actually sustainable, especially in light of some of the challenges it is facing in Japan. Okay, in terms of what to look out for this week, uh, we have more REITs reporting their earnings, including Maple Tree Industrial Trust and Capital Land Escort Trust. Okay, uh, we also go into the US season uh, with a lot of US tech stocks reporting, including Google, Microsoft, Meta, Apple, and Amazon. So quite a number of US Magnificent 7 stocks to be keeping a lookout for after the very strong earnings reported by Tesla last week. Lastly, uh, we have the US non-form payroll data on Friday, 1st of November. So while we have the public holiday in Singapore on Thursday, uh, we do have a fairly busy uh, finance calendar to be keeping a lookout for. Okay, uh, with that, I'll hand over to Sunny, who will bring us through the technical analysis. Okay, thanks, Gerald, for the updates on some of the Singapore REITs counter that should give the investor some clarity over what to expect because of a bit of a uh, pick up, tick up in the uh, US uh, yields. So just to wrap up uh, Gerald's um, uh, presentation earlier, so we are expecting a 50 basis point cut spread out uh, through November and December for the rest of the year. So we are expecting 50 basis point cut uh, from the US Fed for the next, uh, straight over the next two months. On the economic calendar, um, this week, of course, on Thursday, we have the uh, Fed uh, preferred uh, inflation gauge, which is the PCE price index on Thursday. And then we have the non-farm payroll data on Friday. These are two key data that the Fed uh, will watch out and calibrate uh, their rate cuts going forward. And after that, we get a weekend break and then we will start to tune in 
to the US election, which both of the candidates has has very contrasting um, policy, I would say, with Trump uh, likely going to introduce the tariff 2.0, which could cause the inflation to flare up again. So I don't know which is your preferred candidate for the US election, but if you have any preferred candidates, do share them in the comments on our YouTube channel below, and we can have a bit of discussion over there. Okay, next on the earnings calendar, um, Jaro went through earlier. So as you can see, there's a lot of uh, companies that's earning uh, re reporting their earnings this week. I prefer to use the trading view earning calendar where I can sort them by market cap. And then you can see that Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Meta are all reporting their earnings this week with their EPS estimate, revenue forecast, and the date and the timing, whether it's before or after market, that the results will come out. So you can use this uh, earnings calendar to track some of the biggest uh, Magnificent 7 earnings announcement that's coming up this week. Okay, so let's move back to the charts. I want to start with the US indices first today. So we can see that the US indices had a mixed finish last Friday, as well as on a weekly basis, which Gerald shared earlier, that only the NASDAQ Composite Index managed to eat out a small of a small 0.2% gain. The other two indices had some pullbacks. So I'll try to give you some of the rationale behind this move. So the Dow Jones Index, as you can see over here, dropped 0.61% last Friday or dropping 259 points. I would say this is due to some of the big names in the Dow Jones Index, which is a 30 component stocks index, like the big banks had already uh, reported their earnings. So most of the upside in the Dow Jones Index had already been priced in and the earnings are reported. So some of the investors are actually taking profit off the Dow Jones Index counters, okay, the 30 stock index, and sort of reposition, they could be repositioning them into the upcoming uh, tech stocks, which are going to give their uh, report their earnings this week. So that is that caused a bit of a pullback on the Dow Jones Index. But nonetheless, you can see that the long-term uptrend of the Dow Jones Index, which is a reflection of some of the biggest companies in US and the US economy, is still on a firm uptrend. Thereby, if you ask me if I would get into the Dow Jones Index, I would say yes, once it gets closer to the 50 days moving average in blue, which also coincides with the lower bound of their Bollinger Band right now at 41,700 or 41,800. That is where it, there could be opportunity coming in again for the Dow Jones Index to do a rebound. Why is this so? Because you can see that uh, the Bollinger Band, which are the black lines, the, the most 90% of the time, the index usually trade within this Bollinger Band. And you can see that on the 10th of September, when it touched the lower bound of the Bollinger Band, which also coincide with the 50 days exponential moving average, the index had a rebound back up again. So this is the opportunity that I'm watching. I also saw it happen somewhere on the 6th of August as well. Okay, so you can see that the MACD indicator is now negative, now telling us that, hey, we have a quite a substantial a downtrend momentum right now. So now is still not the time to get into the Dow Jones Index. At least we need to see the downtrend momentum starts to subside where you will see some of the MACD histogram here fading from the red into the light red or the pink histogram. That could be the early signal of when, where we can get in on the Dow Jones Index. The RSI has also crossed below the 50-point neutral mark, now reading at 46. So that means that um, uh, the momentum is actually very weak right now and we could expect further pullbacks towards the 41,000 or 41,800, 41,700 level on the Dow Jones Index, okay? Next, let me move to the S&P 500. So the S&P 500 had a slightly smaller drop compared to the Dow Jones Index because uh, I believe the Magnificent 7 contribute about 20% of the market cap in the S&P 500 index. So it is not that uh, heavily affected compared to the Dow Jones index in terms of the profit taking so far into the earnings season. The S&P 500 is currently using the 20 days moving average or the basis of the Bollinger Band at 5,790 points or we round it off to 5,800 as the support level right now. And also they are positioning themselves into the uh, the earning season of the uh, Magnificent 7 this week. And hence the near-term resistance, I would want to re-emphasize the year-to-date high, which is at 5,878 points, or even let's run it off to 5,009. If we get a 
a earnings result that is uh, meeting analyst expectation, or I would say have to be above analyst expectation, we could be testing the 5,900 level, which is also the upper bound of the Bollinger Band right now at 5,899. Okay? So I don't think it will fall uh, towards the 50 days moving average so soon, unless the earnings of the MAX7 actually miss uh, greatly. But if that is the case, I'm still... I still feel that the, the tech sector or the MAX7 will continue to grow going forward uh, into next year, 2025. And that could mean an opportunity to accumulate again on the S&P 500 index. But looking at the earnings season so far, more than 70% of the companies that have reported so far has uh, met or have some uh, earning surprise towards the upside of their EPS, that could mean that uh, we are going into still a strong earning season. And hence, I'm more in favor of the S&P 500 challenging the 5,900 resistance level before we see a pullback again after the Magnificent 7 earnings, which we will go into the 5th November election. And that could push down the S&P 500 if it's going to challenge the upper resistance of 5,900. Okay? Indicator-wise, MACD is negative, so negative momentum is uh, telling us it's coming down. But uh, I also have one eye on the uh, futures market, which opened, which in early trading, you can see that it's up like more than half a percent on some of the major US indices. So that probably negate all the losses that we saw last Friday on the US index. And investors are positioning very strongly into the max 7 earning in the early trading of the US futures index. Okay. So the RSI is now at 56, so it's still above the 50-point neutral mark. So thereby, it still have a bit of a positive momentum, 6 point above the 50 neutral point mark. So this is a contradicting to the MACD indicator. So when we have indicators that contradict each other, that would mean that um, the trend is uncertain or, or negated or neutralized. So I would say that it will be the 20 days moving average at 5,000 800 points to 5,900 points. This is the range that we will be likely be trading in for the S&P 500 for this week into the earnings of the MAX7. Lastly, the NASDAQ index, NASDAQ Composite Index. Okay, So we saw a bit of jump on the NASDAQ Composite Index, especially on Friday itself. It's jumped about 103 points, which is 0.56%. And for the week, it jumped 0.2%. So you can see that we actually had a new all-time high on last Friday, but we did not manage to have an all-time close. Some of investors uh, actually take some profit off after we hit the all-time high level, which is um, expected because uh, there will always be investors or traders uh, placing their sell order into the, into the previous all-time high to take profit off the previous level that they missed. Okay? So the all-time high of the NASDAQ Composite Index stands at 18,690 points, which was achieved last Friday. And you can see that positioning themselves, the, the tick, uptick in the NASDAQ Composite in, on Friday signifies that there is optimism of uh, investors or trader looking into the MAX7 earnings this week. Okay, And you can see that the MACD indicator is uh, slightly negative. The is down by negative 9.97 point. That is the indication that uh, the momentum may not be very strong. But if I'm going to change it into the futures index, then you can see that um, the candlestick performance is actually very strong. But it is, this is just the early part of trading. So uh, I would not say it is uh, it is it has any significance unless we are getting it closer to the end of the day where we have the candle close for the confirmation. Okay, so uh, if you look at the RSI index, it's at 60 point now, showing healthy momentum uh, around the 60 point level. So we can still have some uh, momentum that is in the NASDAQ Composite Index point now to push the index higher for a higher all-time high this week with the max 7 earnings. So MACD, I would say, is a neutral reading. It has been trending sideways for the past two weeks, I would say. And with slightly positive reading on the RSI, I am slightly positive on the NASDAQ Composite Index hitting another all-time high, which could be testing the 18,700 level in the next two weeks. Okay, so next, let's move to the STI Index. Okay, so STI Index has been fairly neutral, I would say, in the past two weeks. We do have a jump last week, which we saw a 1.86% jump in the STI. But last week, uh, 
we saw a decline of about 1.3%, so giving up much of the gains that we saw in the previous week. So the all-time or the six-year high or the year-to-hit date high still stand at the 3,652 points. So we are about 1.5% away from that level right now. So will the STI continue to push up further? Uh, reiterating what I said last week, I think it is very challenging for the STI to retest the next highest level, which is around the 3,900 level. And that was the previous all-time high that we saw on the STI index. Uh, for STI to jump up to the next resistance level is actually quite difficult. So I think that uh, the STI would likely finish around the 3,600 and 50 points level towards the end of the year. Okay. The MACD indicator reading for the past two to three weeks has been uh has been negative and has been trending downwards, thereby applying more pressure on the STI index in a downward cycle. And the RSI, as you can see, is closer to the 50 point neutral mark, showing telling us that momentum is uh, slightly weak right now, still above 50 points, but very close to it. So I would believe that this sort of a range bound trading pattern on the STI will likely continue. And the support level could come in the lower bound of the Bollinger Band at 3595, which is around 3006. And with the 50 days moving average catching up at 3543 points. Okay, so 3550 would be the support for the STI targeting the year to date, uh, year -to -date high at 3652 points. That will give us a range of 100 point trading in the STI index for the next few weeks. Okay. But I think the attention will be on the US this week because we have a short trading week as well. So I do not expect much on the STI movement for this week. So this is uh, what I observed in the market for this uh, last week and what I foresee next this week. So anything else we want to look out for, Gerald? Yes, I think it is really the US earnings season with the large cap tech stocks that are reporting this week that we'll be keeping a close look out for. Uh, we had a number of the REITs reporting last week and that continues through this week and we see whether some of the REITs will be able to report better distributions in the third quarter of this year. Yes, so a lot of uh, exciting things happening this week. And before we end the show today, I think we want to wish all our uh, friends a uh, happy Deepavali. And before we uh, we wish you a safe and of course a, a trading week that uh, with that short that could have some volatility, but we will still see you again on the next weekly market review. So anything to say to our uh, friends, uh, Gerald? Yes, so happy Deepavali and see you uh, next week. Okay, thank you everyone. See you next week, next Monday, same time, same place on our weekly market review. Goodbye. Thank you.